Japanese variant is better known than the Chinese one, but it comes from China, of course. And there is this opinion that this is a, a really purely Chinese development, but it's not. It comes from India. And I will uh, say a few things to make this clear for a moment. It all started, uh, every, some of you may know anyway, uh, one stanza, one gata in Chinese translation, which says, one does not establish writing, offering a separate transmission outside of any teaching, so no writings. One directly points at the human mind, actually here is already a problem because mind is an in English translation for, for xin in Chinese, which would be chitta, and then uh, sometimes I say the heart, <laughs> well, my heart is here and not there, uh, but the Chinese culture thinks with the heart, apparently, which is nice to know. And then the last verse, last pada, says, seeing one's nature, one becomes a Buddha, because one's nature is already Buddha nature. There is this belief in Chan Buddhism that we all have uh, Tathagata embryo inside us. We all have the Tathagata Garba, and the best translation for Garba is embryo. It has, of course, more than one meaning and one, more than one translation, but Tathagata embryo is a good translation. We all have that. We are already Buddha. Our Buddha nature is just covered over by impurity. So, in our practice, we should cleanse. Uh, away all the impurities and our Buddha nature will come through and then we will become a we will obviously for everybody to see be a Buddha. This is the Tathagata Garva theory which is central for Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism as one called it. Now how this these words were written down in 1252 in in a text called Buddha Huiyuan, about uh, this text is a summary of uh, five official histories of Chan Buddhism, written in the 13th century. We have five official histories in the 13th century of Chan Buddhism, of Zen Buddhism, and the text from which these words comes come is a, a summary of all five of them. And these are very famous words. Everybody, need, about, everybody interested in Chan Buddhism knows this. Now, how did it come to this? Uh, well, there are two Indians to be named in the whole genesis, in the whole coming into existence of Chan Buddhism. They're both, the first one is Gunabhadra. Gunabhadra, and the second one is Bodhidharma. Gunabhadra, is, uh, his dates are 394, 394 to 468. Those are his dates. Uh, and he was, a, he was a Brahmin from Madhya Desha, from the central area. By the way, Madhya Desha, if you translate Madhya Desha to Chinese, you, you get Zhong, Zhongguo, you know, Zhongguo. So Zhongguo is China, the, the Middle Kingdom, and the Sanskrit for that is Madhya Desha. So you have a Chinese one and an Indian one. Uh, the Madhya Desha uh, is usually the area of Magadha, but also UP these days, and even West Bengal for, uh, for but that's Madhya Desha, Magadha normally. This, uh, he was a Brahmin from there, and he, as every Brahmin, he studied the Brahmanical knowledge. And he, be at one day, he read a Buddhist Abhidharma text called Mishraka Abhidharma Hridaya. Mishraka Abhidharma Hridaya, the heart of the Abhidharma, with 
miscellaneous additions. It's, it's, it's a text written by a Gandharan, early 4th century. The name is Dharmatrat. So this Dharmatrata wrote Mishra Kabi Dharma Hridaya, early 4th century, and this text converted the Brahmin Gunabhadra to Buddhism. He was not the only one. Many Brahmins converted to that kind of Sarvastivada Buddhism. Many did. Uh, usually in Madhya Desh, in, in Pataliputra, in that Pataliputra Ayodhya, most come from there. And uh, so he, as so what happened with so many Brahmins, he met other Buddhist teachers after his conversion, and one was a Mahasangika teacher. And the Mahasangika teacher was telling him that uh, nothing exists and you should become a Samyak Sambuddha, not an Arhat. So he was telling him about the, well, the opposite ideas as the Staviras had taught him. So because you have mainly two large families in Buddhism up to the, up till right now. It, fro it results from the first Sangabheda, from the first split, where you have Mahasangikas, and the other ones who did not have a name for themselves, there was just a Sangha, uh, but the ones who split off had a name for themselves. They are the Mahasangikas. And they had different ideas. And those two families split up, of course, but they all had common characteristics. All those different Nikayas in, this, in the two uh, Mahasangikas and the non-Mahasangikas, we call them Staviravada. But Saviravada is not an old term. This is a new term, which is a Sanskritization of the Pali Theravada. It, the word Taviravada does not occur in ancient literature. Uh, so this, uh, we make it up to say that they are not Mahasangikas. So Mahasangikas, all the families, all the, all the, the branches within this family have common characteristics. They all say nothing exists but they have different opinions about emptiness. They all say nothing exists, while the others, we call them Saviravada, say the dharmas, factors, all exist. Uh, so the, you can make a list of the two common characteristics of the two families. And in Madhya Desha, when someone was converted, usually the Brahmin would be converted to Sarvastivada Buddhism. Then he would meet another, a Mahasangika teacher, saying quite different things. Uh, saying everything does not exist, everything is non-existent. Uh, so this uh, Gunabhadra studied those opinions too. He studied about Prajna Paramita literature, he studied Avatansaka Sutra in his days. He even got the bodhisattva precepts initiated into that. So he also had Mahasangika studies, uh, Mahasangika past. So he had two. And in his days, he was probably, because he was born in 394, so he was probably converted early in the 5th century. In those days, the Sarvastivadins were in two groups. One was the new Kashmira orthodoxy, started during Kanishka. The dates of Kanishka are 155, 179. Those are the dates which are now accepted. Of course, there was a long debate about that, but this is what is now accepted the last 10 years, for the last, ever since 2008. It's uh, not even 10 years, actually. It is, uh, there was an article published by, uh, in Germany, and the dates seem now accepted. 155, 179 are the dates. And so then a new orthodoxy was established, which is Buddha Bhashita, the word of the Buddha. I think the people who were establishing this Buddha Bhashita Abhidharma must have felt very well, you know. <laughs> they, were, they were establishing what the Buddha had said, actually. Uh, so, but, the, well, this is just a... They established the Buddha Bhashita Abhidharma. 
but you had traditional Sarvastivadis at the moment. They already existed ever since Ashoka. So ever, Ashoka already, in his days, you had Sarvastivadins. Of course, they were not the new Buddha Bhashta Abhidharma kind of Sarvastivadins. They didn't exist at the time. So you have traditional ones, the majority, and you have a new orthodoxy in Kashmir. So you had two groups. But in Madhya Desha, in North India, let's say, the majority was traditional, not the new Vaibhashika group. So our Gunabhadra was converted to the traditional Sarvastivada ideas, not to the new Kashmira ideas. And he had also influence of Mahasangikas. So in his days, he was quite influenced by the new also by new developments within traditional Sarvastivadins. There I especially two I will mention. The, you have the maybe you heard about Chitta Matra idea, so meaning Chitta only. This is a Staviravada reaction against emptiness. Okay, the Mahasangika say everything empty, non existent. And then the opponents say, all right, all right, but citta is there. Citta exists, thoughts and the mind, that's there. And we still should develop knowledge, not prajna, but jnana. That's what we should develop. So uh, there is the emptiness of the Mahasangikas, and you have the reaction of the others to that, saying, citta matra, that's there. And in this citta, we plant seeds. Our karma, our actions, plant bijas in our mental continuum, as it's in our mind. Uh, so the seed, the bija theory, is also belongs to the traditional Sarvastivadins. This is important to know because f the step from bija to garba it's not very far, you know. I can even say so. It's quite. It happens, probably happening right now somewhere in the world. So this, from bija to garba, the development from the, for the believers in the bija theory, to the believers in the tathagata garba theory, I believe they're the same people. If you believe in the bija theory as the traditional Sarvastivadins do then the next step to take is a Tathagata Garba belief. I just link Bija Garba, that's all I do. So this idea uh, from Bija to Garba and our embryo is a Tathagata one. Now the others, the Mahasangikas, immediately said yes. We have always said that we wanted to be a Samyak Sambuddha. So they immediately agreed with this. So the texts about the Tagata Garba started as Sarvastivada, traditional Sarvastivada, but were immediately taken up by the competition, let's say, who agreed. And the result is called Ekayana. The result is called Ekayana. When, when a Staviravada idea is taken up by the Mahasangikas, who call themselves Mahayana, then the result is called Ekayana. This is quite important. And when, if you turn it the other way around, if the Staviravada people use a Mahasangika idea, that also happened, then they call the result Mahayana too. You know? So the Mahasangikas are Mahayana, they call that themselves Mahayana in the Ashtasasrika Pratyana Paramita more than 15 times actually. So they call their own emptiness Pratyana Buddhism Mahayana. When the others, the competition, the Staviras, use their idea, they call the result Mahayana too. What I'm saying looks quite simple. Well, it is simple, that's why it looks simple. But it has far reaching consequences actually. Uh, so this uh, Gunabhadra had both. 
he had the best of both worlds. He saw the new developments within the traditional Savasti Vadins who believe in Chittamatra, who believe in Tathagata Garbha and Ekayana. And this is a, this explains his formative years in India. That's what he learned here in India. And then he goes to, to China. I, I, I believe he takes a boat in Tamralipti, Tamlok, in Bay of Bengal, and sails along India's east coast, down, all the way down to Sri Lanka, and stays a while in Sri Lanka. By the way, the culture of Sri Lanka and of the mainland cannot be cut, you know. You cannot, uh, uh, everything that happens on the mainland eventually ripples down to Sri Lanka, and it also also has the other way some influence. So he goes to Sri Lanka. There takes a boat to the Malay Peninsula, and eventually to South China. And there he arrives in Guangzhou in 435, 435. He arrives there. Uh, Actually, not Guangzhou, Foshan. Fo means Buddha, and Foshan means mountain. The Buddha mountain is, is an, a city very close to Canton these days. Uh, so, because Canton is bigger, people usually say Canton or Guangzhou, but it's actually Buddha mountain where he arrived. Gunabada arrived there. And then the next year, 436, he arrives in the southern capital there, and he starts working. He starts making translations. And now we get to the wordless teaching. We, he starts making translations. The oldest catalog of Chinese translations dates from five, 518, 518. So that is not so long after the death of our Gunabhadra, yes? Maybe the one who compiled the catalog still knew people who had known him. You know, it's still very recent. And he gives 11 titles of texts which were translated by Gunabhadra. And four were already lost, so soon. That's what this oldest catalog says. So 11 existing titles and four lost, oh, 13 altogether. If we take later catalogs of the Chinese Tripitaka, the next catalog is 597, end of the same sixth century, there the author attributes more than 70 titles to Gunabhadra. He had his reasons to do that, I'm sure. Uh, so one should rely on that old catalog, which is very near to the life of Gunabhadra himself. So those, we are safe, on safe ground, when we believe those attributions are correct. Now, what is attribute, attributed to him? I made a, drew it up, looked it up, the Samyuktagama. There's a Sanskrit Samyuktagama. Uh, he brought that from, Anuradha Pura, he, he accepted it in Sri Lanka, which means Sri Lanka was not only Pali, you also had Sanskrit, even in the fifth century, which is the classical Pali period. Yes. Uh, so even in the fifth century, you had still quite some Sanskrit. Samyuktagama was there, and Gunabhadra translated it. He probably brought it back from there. There is a Sri Mala Devi Singhanara Sutra. There is a Tathagata Garbha Sutra, which people say was probably written in Andhra Pradesh, in Andhra area, at the end of the third century. So I guess our Gunabhadra, while sailing along the coast, because in those days you didn't cross oceans, you sailed along the coast. And so he's sailing along the coast because of water and food and practical reasons you, uh, and clim climatological reasons. So there are all lots of practical reasons why the people stayed close to the coast. So he went down and he probably got that text there in Andhra Pradesh, 
and he brought it out in China. Uh, two more of the Tagata Garba texts, Anguli Maliya Sutra, and another one, short one, called Mahabhedi Haraka Sutra. To Tathagata Garba Sutra. So Tathagata Garba was clearly on his mind. Uh, he also wrote the Sandhi Nirmochana Sutra. Sandhi Nirmochana, that has been translated three times into Chinese and three times with a different title. Uh, the way Gunabhadra sees it, Sandhi means Santati, Chitta Santati, a series of thoughts, Chitta Santati. So in our Chitta Santati, uh, that's how that is our that's where we plant our bijas our karmic seeds we planted in our chitta santati and this should be vimukta this, it's, uh, or nirmukta this should be deliberate, liberated freed so that's how we understand sandhi nirmochana as the liberation of our chitta santati meanings sandhi is the series of our thoughts. That's how he translates this. And finally, and this is the most important text, the Lankavatara Sutra. The Lankavatara Sutra, meaning the descent to Lanka. Why did our Gunabhadra bring out Lankavatara Sutra? Well, he did so himself, didn't he? He went to Lanka. Uh, so he uh, brought the Lankavatar. And this Lankavatar Sutra, what does it say? Basically, it brings Chitta Matra ideas. And I say on purpose, Chitta Matra. I do not say Vijnana Vada. Vijnana Vada is Asanga's kind of later development. Chitta Matra is older than Asanga. So that's why I s the Chitta Matra is the older version. And Vijnana Vada is the newer version, let's say. So he, in the Lankavatara, you have Chitta Matra, this only thought. And also the Tathagata Garba ideas. Those two ideas are central in there. Now, and also teaching without words. That's what it that's how it where it begins. Now I came up with a very simple idea. Uh, our Gunabhadra, when he arrived in China, he didn't know Chinese. He never studied it. And when he arrived there, the emperor assigned two monks to help him with practical day-to-day -day living. But they were not really intellectuals. They could not translate anything. The one who really could was another a Chinese monk called Bao Yun who was there, who had been working with other Indians before, and who knew Sanskrit well. He had been to Gandhara, together with Fa Xian, but Bao Yun had gone back home from Gandhara, and Fa Xian had continued on to Sri Lanka and back to China that way, so they were good friends, those two. So this, uh, how, how could Gunabhadra, who did not know Chinese, Translate all those texts I just mentioned, including the Lankavatara, you see. So I, I think because he did not know Chinese, he proposed teaching without words. That's a very simple idea, I just say. Actually, uh, if this happens in Lhasa, for example, Kamalashila, goes from Vikramashila to Lhasa, doesn't know Tibetan, writes Bhavanakrama in Sanskrit, because that's what he knows. And then the locals translate this to Tibetan. Everybody says, yeah, of course, so what? That's normal. But if the same thing happens in China, nobody thinks about it. Those Indians arriving in China, they didn't know Chinese nine times out of ten. There are exceptions. Kumara Jiva is an exception. But they did not know Chinese. So how did they do all those translations? What the Brahmin Gunabhadra in, the, in China, fifth century, really knew was how to write a Sanskrit text. 
he could do that. And his Chinese monk assistant, Bao Yun, could translate that. So he couldn't teach, he couldn't preach, he couldn't speak, use the Chinese language. He wrote, and Bao Yun translated, and another Chinese wrote down, Hui Guan. So this idea of preaching without words was actually a necessity for him. Uh, of course, there are philosophical reasons to agree with this kind of view. Uh, teaching without words is a very Asian way, you know. You, you should look at the example of the teacher and do the same thing, which is more important than the factual knowledge he can give to you. So the way of educating, uh, not only in India, but also in China, is just uh, by example, mostly. Uh, so teaching without words, you really don't need words really to teach if you are convinced of that ideal. But in China you need a text. And our Gunabhadra wanted to say what he had to say about the Tagata Garba, about Chitta Matra. And how could he do that, not knowing Chinese? Writing a text, of course. And this text was a Sanskrit text and Gunabhadra is responsible for that himself. Now, if we look at the Lankavatara Sutra studies so far, uh, there is Daisetsu Tetaro Suzuki, you know, uh, the famous Japanese Suzuki, who translated the whole Lankavatara from Sanskrit to English. It's, uh, he says the author is probably someone who lived maybe around 400 AD. Well, that's already very close to our Gunabhadra, yes? Already very close. Uh, there are more uh, translations of this Lankavatara Sutra, so there was a text. Because some Indians arrived in China, and they did not have a library on their back. They knew they had it in their head. They could recite texts. And the Chinese could translate, and the Indian would give guidance how to do it, and the text is the result of cooperation. Uh, it, but the Chinese are polite, civilized people, so they will not say, I did this. They will say, this Indian brings the ideas and he is responsible for this text. So the Indian did it. While in practice, the Indian couldn't even speak Chinese. So how could he translate it? He could only talk Sanskrit to some people who know Sanskrit too there, and the Chinese would make it, and then it's the result of a discussion, not necessarily of a written text. But Gunabhadra wrote the text, I'm sure, uh, because if there is a second translation and a third translation, there must have been a text which was translated again and again. So the second translation is by Bodhi Ruchi in, in uh, 513, 513, Bodhiruchi, the Indian. And this translation contains, mo is more than double as long as the first one. It's, uh, the first one had four volumes, and this one has 11. So it was very, very much longer. How to explain that? Well, I used to say the, the wordless teaching really got longer, <laughs> yes, expanded. Uh, I'm sure that there were many Brahmins who arrived in Luoyang in China, coming because Central Asia was under the control of the Northern Wei dynasty, Pei Wei, who transferred their capital from Datong today to Luoyang today. So the capital was moved in 494, and then many Brahmins arrive from Central Asia and from India, and Bodhiruchi was one of them. And more came, many more came, because Central Asia was wide open. It, many could come. And so I'm sure that other Brahmins were willing to give their learned explanations to the existing version. 
that already makes it a bit longer. The original translation also contained mm, passages which are not very clear to the Chinese. So Bao Yun was a very good Chinese monk who knew Sanskrit, but he was apparently not a philosopher. He was he could translate he translated the Buddha Charita to Chinese. But the translating the Buddha Charita in the Lankavatara, that's still different. You know, the Lankavatara is philosophy. Buddha Charita is Buddhist history, let's say. So the translation by Bao Yun needed some clarifications. So those explanations were also put into the text. And then, finally, there were two parts added at the end. One called Dharani. Dharani is also makes one think of Brahmanical knowledge, yes. And the last one was called, well, in, in Bodhiruchi's time, it was called a summary. Later, it would be called Sagatakam. In, in Gathas, say the same thing in Gathas, in verse form, which is also a very Brahmatical and actually Indian way of presenting something. First, you explain it, the whole thing in prose, and then you say exactly the same thing, but in verse form. You know, this, even people in conferences in India do this, you know, this happens. So the, in those days, the same thing happened. That's called it Sagatakam. So there are additional parts to the original text that make it much longer. Uh, and by the way, uh, the third one, the third translation is made in 704 by Shikshananda. Shikshananda was a monk from Khotan. Khotan along the, the Southern Silk Road. Shik Shikshananda. Uh, in 704, in seven volumes. So he reduced much of the additions, but he kept, he kept, he even added actually a first chapter uh, called Ravana Dieshana, Ra the, the request of Ravana. The whole Lankavatara Sutra is written, is supposedly proclaimed by the Buddha in Sri Lanka, in the fortress of Ravana, the Rakshasa king in, in, in Lanka. And uh, he was preaching there to Mahamati. Uh, this is a, so this is a very Brahmatical set, setting. Very familiar with Gunabhadra, by the way. This is one more argument why Gunabhadra thought it up himself. You know, it's his teaching, his past, his formative years, his social background really explain why he would put it in the fortress of Ravana, very well known by the Ram, in the Ramayana. You know, so this is a Brahmanical setting, and he adds this first this first chapter there, uh, and he still adds the keeps the two editions at the end, calling Dharani and Sagatakam. So this last version. Now. There's one more thing I need to tell you, that is that this Sanskrit text, I'm sure it was composed by the, not, not, the one who did not know Chinese, Gunabhadra, in cooperation with Chinese monks. This Chinese, this Indian text, this Sanskrit text, found its way back to Nepal, to northwestern India. So see, I'm sure via Khotan. Uh, so from uh, from the Bodhiruchi version in 513, this Bodhiruchi version in 513, it's not only Indians going to China, but also Chinese things going back to India because the road is open in two directions. So the Sanskrit text written by Gunabhadra in Loyang also found its found found its way west. That's why in uh, Northwest India and especially Nepal today, you have you have Sanskrit manuscripts of the Lankavatara. In Tibet, you have Sanskrit manuscripts of the Lankavatara. So this and they seem to start in the sixth century. So now people 
studying the subject, say that the Sanskrit text composed in East Asia, in, in, in China, found its way in the sixth century to the West. See, so here we have a good example of a text, an Indian text, from China to India again. You know, it's, and I'm sure this is not the only case, because if you if we look at many at the catalogues, those Indians, as I said, they did not carry a library on their back. They know they recited, and sometimes they forgot part of it, Be uh, and then they had to wait for another Indian to finish the whole thing. This happened to the Ashtagranta Abhidharma. This is, uh, so it happened more than once. Or sometimes they had a manuscript, no doubt about that. But sometimes they had not. And then he would just teach. And the Chinese make a text. So, uh, and if it ultimately comes from an Indian, it is correct. It is really a sutra in their mind, you know. If, it, if some Central Asian does it, uh, or brings a text, that's not a real Indian, so they call it a, a fake sutra. <laughs> or if, if the origin is not Indian, it's not right. It's not true. Uh, that's what they believe. But under Indian, you, India, India is already North Afghanistan. And of course, Pakistan, that's Gandhara. And then all the way down to Sri Lanka. In the East Asian mind, that is India. That is the cultural area called India. That is what one calls Mahi. That is the earth. Yes, this is. And then if it comes from there, it's true. And Lankavatara, now you know about the wordless teaching, why, why this idea started, because the Indian didn't know Chinese. So I know this is not very philosophical, but it's very practical, you know. It's, uh, one should look at the circumstances too, not only the development of ideas, but one should look at practical developments. So the Indian arrived there, couldn't, preached the Dharma, wrote a text, Chinese translated, and the text found its way back via Khotan to the Indian area. This is, the, this is uh, what happened to the Lankavatara suit. Now there is, in China you should have a text. There is, it's not possible to have a tradition without text. In India you can talk. You have the argumentative Indian. <laughs> but in China you write down like a secretary does. You know, this is uh, the difference between the two in general outline. So in China, you, ne you need a Lanka Sutra. And uh, an alternative text for the title Lanka Avatar Sutra, by the way, is uh, Sarva Buddha Pravachana Hardaya. That's an alternative title. So it's the heart of the teaching, of the preaching of all the Buddhas. Sarva Buddha Pravachana Hridaya. This is an alternative title for the Lankavatara Sutra. Uh, so Buddhism, even Chan Buddhism, has text. In our Bodhidharma, and this is what with whom I will conclude with Bodhidharma, Bodhidharma, who is supposedly the first patriarch in China, Actually, personally, I think it's Gunabhadra, <laughs> because he brings the ideas. But Bodhidharma never wrote anything. It's well, he didn't know Chinese. And he didn't even have official help from Chinese monks, like Gunabhadra did. Our poor Bodhidharma could just meditate. And somehow make some things clear to the Chinese. But he never translated anything. Of course not, he couldn't. Uh, and because he never wrote, he was acceptable to everyone. You see? Because when you write something, people put a label on you. That's what you do, that's what you can. Whenever someone asks me, what do you do? I always say, ask others, you know. They, they put labels enough on my forehead. <laughs> this is, uh, they know better than I do. So this is, uh, 
Bodhidharma never wrote anything. So he was acceptable to all kinds of Chan Buddhists. While Gunabhadra was known for his Lankavatara Sutra, and when later the focus shifted away from the Lankavatara text to the Vajracedika Prajnaparamita, that's happened in the, after 730 in the 8th century, then the Lankavatara people were out. And the new Prajnaparamita Chan, Vajracedika kind of Chan, was popular. But Bodhidharma stayed because he never wrote anything. And Gunabhadra was connected with the Lankavatara. Bodhidharma, uh, he, well, there is one text which is called Two Entrances and Four Behaviors. It's a, that's a text only in Chinese, and it was probably written by his only intellectual disciple. He had a few disciples, Chinese, but they never wrote anything except one. One was an intellectual. He is called Tan Lin, and he wrote. Uh, probably he wrote down what he what his master, the the central, the core of the teaching of of his master of Bodhidharma, and the title is called Two Accesses, Two Entrances, and Four Behaviors. Now those two accesses seem very much like Shamatha Vipassana. You know, shamatha is the meditation. And in this, f f at the beginning, the tatwa is explained, which is the true nature, which is the Buddha nature. Uh, and we see this in, according to him, it is in wall contemplation that you see that. Wall contemplation in East Asia is really interpreted quite literal. The monks sit facing a wall. Uh, but actually, if you read, if you, this wall, I wrote it in an article which will come out next year in Pacific World in Berkeley. Uh, this wall is also a cliff. A cliff can be a wall. And if it is cliff meditation, that means Bodhidharma was sitting in a cave up a cliff, meditating. And if you go there today to the Shaolin Monastery in Henan, northern part, you, a little bit beyond the Shaolin Monastery, you have the, the, the Bodhidharma cave where he used to meditate. You can still go up there, and that's where he used to sit on Mount Songshan. That's where he used to sit. So he's, he was sitting up a cliff in a cave. So this wall is a cliff. He was actually sitting in a cave up a cliff. It's not just looking at a wall. It's, uh, it's much more simple than that. So this is, anyway, this meditation, that's the first explanation, the first entrance. Uh, that's shamatha, yes? Shamatha, they say, brings us into a state where we see light and where we can see vipassana. You know? So first you need shamatha in order to, see the vip to be able to do the vipassana. You need both are linked. And vipassana of, is prajna. And prajna means you know all the dharmas. That's when you have prajna, dharma pravichaya. Uh, maybe if I'm too technical, uh, please excuse me. <laughs> but so the, the, the second entrance is about behavior, but this behavior is vipassana, vipassana, immediately linked with the shamatha. So the two entries are shamatha and vipassana, and the vipassana is explained as four kinds of behavior. Four kinds of behavior, I can easily tell you. The one is you, you have to do away with dvesha or pratiga, with hatred. Normally, it's maitri bhavana, which you do. Uh, you see everybody as your friend. Maybe they don't know it, <laughs> but you do. So, but 
Bodhidharma was not that kind of person. He, he did not develop. He did not develop friendliness. He did not see everybody as his mitra. He, he said, "Look at your own past." That's what he said to do away with anger. Look, it's the anger now is the result of your previous karma. So you should look at your own past. That's what he says. No developing of maitri there. The second is uh, the second behavior is doing away with moha or avidya. Uh, you should know the pratitya samutpada, the twelve links of causal. Uh, well, Pratitya Samutpada, the twelve links, yes, the twelve Nidanas, which cause you existence. This is number two, and thinking about that, you do away with moha. The third one, he said, you should not have any wish in your life. Do not wish for anything. And for wish, he uses the Chinese equivalent of the, the Sanskrit verb ish, you know, no ishta. No wishes. Uh, that's to do away with karma or raga. So those are the three basic kleshas, bad things in your mind. And then he adds, one should also practice prajnya paramita. That's the fourth behavior. Now, if you look at it, you actually only ha you have five different subjects. Yes, you have shamatha. That's one. And then four behaviors. Altogether, that's five. And this looks very much like traditional Sarvastivada Abhidharma practices, in, especially in a Prayoga Marga. Before you see, before you enter the, the Rupa Dhatu, you must ready your mind to see the first noble truth. You must make yourself ready. If you have too much desire, Usually they say Ashubha Bhavana. If you think too much, usually they say it's uh, Anapana Smarti. So, but Bodhidharma gives a different interpretation, but it's still five exercises, and you're supposed to do five exercises in the Prayoga Marga before entering the Rupa Dhatu. So this teaching of Bodhidharma, he never wrote it down, but his disciple did, is some kind of Sarvastivada looking prayoga marga. This is a, that means Bodhidharma was the same kind of monk as Gunabhadra was. Only Gunabhadra had official help. Uh, Bodhidharma never had that. He just meditated in his cave up a cliff in northern Henan. He left, he arrived in South China, but the Chinese monks were not friendly to him. Actually, I'm not going to many more details here, but the conclusion, if you want to know more, I would be happy to ask, to, 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 re to reply to your questions, but conclusion is, he was a Persian. A Persian, he was a Parthian, he was a Persian. He came, he, he came, he was a Pulsu, as it says. There is a, a Yang Xuanzhi, there's a Chinese historical source of, of 547, uh, 500, yes, 47, which describes the Sangharamas in Luoyang. And there, there is one Dharma, Bodhidharma mentioned in there. And uh, he was a person, it is said in this historical source. And he comes from the from Xi, from the western regions, meaning Central Asia. Now, northern Afghanistan, Bactria in the old days, is already the western regions. It's already Central Asia. So he was a person from Bactria, where many Persians are, even today. It's a very Persian culture-influenced area there. So his family comes from there. But he was born in the south, in South India. That's true. There was a historical source that says he was born in the south. But his family comes from the northwest. And he's a Persian family. And just a concluding remark, just, just to correct one more thing. 
Many people think he was born in Kanchi. In Kanchi Pura. Many people think so. That's in the south, yes. The reason why many people think so is, well, blame the Japanese for that. You know, there, uh, there is a historical source of 1004, 1004, which mentions that Kuma uh, Bodhidharma was born in, and then comes a Chinese term. And this Chinese term is, by the Japanese, interpreted as phonetical. But if you translate it, you get Gandhavati. Gandha, fragrance, and it means reached. Uh, Gandhavati. I know it should be Gandhavati, like Sukhavati, Amaravati, and whatever, you know, but, but the, the long A is not found in any text. It's, but the short A, Gandhavati, is in dictionaries. It. So it's Gandhavati. If you translate it, if you pronounce it in a Sino Japanese way, those same things, if you consider it not as a translation, or if you don't know Sanskrit, then you would read it in the phonetic way, it would be Koshi. Now, Koshi, there is a, in Japanese pronunciation, there is a Koshi, but with written in completely different Chinese characters which is used for kanji, for kanji. So actually the confusion with kanji, it's actually Gandhavati, <laughs> you know. It is, not, it is not a phonetic way of using those Chinese characters like the Japanese say, and even so, they have to say this koshi doesn't make sense, it's not kashi, it's used for another koshi which is used for kanji, you see, so it's very far removed. I'm not saying that Bodhidharma did not come from kanji. He was born in the south. In, he arrived in China in 479, about. That's when he arrived in China, in 479. So in the fifth century, kanji put out, well, Buddhists came from there. But normally there would be Mahasangikas or Mahishasakas. There would not be, there would not be Sarvastivadins normally. You see, so is a. There are some ar arguments against him being from Kanchi. Really, he was just born in a Persian family of Gandharan Bactrian origin in the south, in South India. Probably his family ran away from. Bactria because it was not stable. There were always wars with the Persians, and there was the history of Bactria is quite complicated. So he was the family was probably leaving that area, going to the south, and Bodhidharma was born there, and then he left for South China. So uh, our Bodhidharma, as you have as you know him from art, with a long earring, a thick beard and shouting, you know, he was a very temperamental person, in, born in South India. Kanchi, I'm not sure. He, I would actually rather think it would be Andhra instead of Kanchi, because Andhra is a more a logical place for Sarvastivada kind of Buddhists. Uh, that's, uh, well, I've said many things to teach without words. I was, I, I was going to keep silent for an hour, <laughs> but I just couldn't, couldn't do it. So uh, I gave, gave some ideas. Uh, actually doing things like that, teaching without words, because the man didn't speak Chinese, that simple idea is very normal in Tibet, but it's hardly, nobody thinks of it in China. All those Indians, they didn't know Chinese. I'm sh they didn't. Kumara Jiva did. And by the way, Kumara Jiva is called Rajiv. You know, <laughs> Kuma Rajiv. You know, Kumara Rajiv. In China, they call him Loshir. In Japan, they call him Raju, which means Rajiv. That's his given name.
he was an Indian. Uh, his father was an, a monk, uh, Kumariana, and his mother was local, Jiva, so Kumara Jiva. But the Chinese always mix, see a, a surname, family name, and a given name. And both of them have maximum two characters, two syllables. So Kuma Rajiv, Kuma would be the surname, Rajiv would be the given name. Now for you Indians, this is a very common thing. People called Rajiv, you, Ra Rajiv, Sunil. Uh, if you call on the street, you go out on the street, you say, hey Rajiv, I'm sure somebody will look back, you know, it's a, or Sunil or whatever. This is a very common Indian name. So Kumar Rajiv is Rajiv in East Asia, only that they don't know it. Uh, this is, okay, and, and now I'm open to whatever you want to throw at me. <laughs> this. And about that, you can, you, can find, you can find what I just said. You can f download it if you wish. Uh, Pacific World, Pacific World Journal. It's uh, the Journal of the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Berkeley. Pacific World, and uh, and there you find it with all the footnotes and the bibliography and things like that. Uh, it's the first number is is no, volume fifteen of twenty thirteen. So it's what I'm saying is volume fifteen one five of twenty thirteen two zero one three. That's the first time. The next, I wrote two articles about that. The next is volume 16, one six, of 214. The last one will appear next year, but it will be the 2016 volume, <laughs> you know, because it's always one year late. And there you find about Guna Badra and Bodhidharma in the Lankavatara Sutra, and teaching without words. And there you find all the footnotes and the, and the bibliography and all things, and you can download it for free. It's it's a uh, <laughs> so so. I hope you have you have fun doing it as I had doing it. <laughs> it's uh, actually uh, I'm just doing my hobby, you know. It's uh, something I like. So um, this is not learn it or whatever. It's just fun, you know. Uh, uh, and I would someday like to be in a meeting in China where someone says that Gunapadra translated in 73 titles or whatever. And then I, 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 I'm already enjoying what, what will happen. You know, it, it, it just did only 13 titles and four were already lost. So nine reasons. And he wrote it himself, the Lankavatara. I'm sure he didn't know Chinese. So how could he, how could he do it? Without Chinese help, it was not possible. And the Brahmin just wrote a text. That's what he could do. And he gave it to his assistant. And he translated the thing. And then the text found its way to the West. And it was retranslated later. And I'm sure I can already see the many Brahmins arriving there in China, giving their learned explanations, even without being asked for them. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's uh, it happens all the time, you know, it, it, it happens all the time. So this is a, uh, I can already imagine those things because one should always remember the Indians arriving in the 5th century in China and the Indians in the 24th, 21st century in India are not basically different. They're the same people. So the same mentality. Uh, they arrived there in China. It looks exotic, looking f from our distance in time and space, but actually the same people. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm talking again, you know, and this is supposed to be a teaching without words. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> if, if, if you have any remarks, please. <laughs>